Pastor Wes Bartell is from Montana, Ronan, Montana, if I recall correctly. He's pastored several churches. He was in Williston from 1979 to 1988. He's pastored a number of churches, including this one, for nine years. Two children, Mike, who has a ministry called Free International, working with human trafficking victims in Las Vegas, Nevada. His daughter, Carissa, who is just going off the charts as a barista in a coffee company we heard last night. He is currently serving as the consultant for the Discipleship Ministries Agency in the Assemblies of God in Springfield, Missouri. He's a humble man, a man of God, who would love to be introduced to you as a, a servant of Christ, a husband, a father, and probably, most fun of all, a grandfather. Would you please welcome this morning to our church, Pastor Wes Bartell. The last few days, whew, last few days have been amazing days for my wife and I as we have made our way here to Williston, because they've been times when we have just reminisced, remembered, and just thought of the fantastic times that we had together here. Many of you we have never met, most, but there are many here today as well that we know and we have great stories. So before you tell stories on Diane and I, remember we have stories on some of you that uh, we could use as well. But it has been just fantastic as we have uh, come here and uh, as we walked into this auditorium, uh, tears came to my eyes as I just thought to myself, God, this is something that you wanted to do. Because I remember being in the first building, I was only 31 years of age when I came as pastor. Now that may be a surprise to you that that was a little while ago, but 31 years of age was quite a while ago. Diane and I just this past year celebrated our 50th anniversary together and uh, have enjoyed that greatly, but 31 years of age when I first came. And it was amazing in the church down by the high school there. We ultimately moved out from that church, of course, to a high school auditorium because we sold the facility. And then from the high school auditorium to the facility that is part of this facility here today. God has been good. He's met us at every single step of the way. And now when I look back at that time, I just thank the Lord for how he provides. And here's something that I want you to remember. If God has provided, protected, and given to his people in the past, he is an unchanging God and you can count on him for the future. So stand on that, hold on to that. It's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Diana, I want you to stand up if you would. For those of you that have not met my wife, this is my wife, Diane. I am one fortunate individual. 50 years together, and we're just talking about all the great things that we've enjoyed and what we've done. And yes, she is much better looking than I am. I know that. You don't have to tell me that. So uh, everyone does, and uh, I'm just grateful that uh, God has given me my wife. I told you that we were 31 years of age when we first came to this uh, community in town. Uh, it's changed a lot since that time. I don't have to tell you that, but it is part of what we deal with. And uh, the years in between have gone by so quickly. In fact, it's kind of interesting when we were pastoring in a Church, some time ago, I was asked to go visit a lady that was no longer attending the church, but she had attended, and everyone simply knew her as grandma, and they were actually celebrating her 104th birthday. That's getting up there in age, 104 years of age. So they said, we know that you have not met her as of yet, but pastor, it would be good for you to go visit her. So I went down to the rest home. She was still very alert and sharp, but she was in a wheelchair and kind of hard of hearing. So when you talked to her, you had to shout, and everybody in the room could hear what you said. And I remember going up to her and saying to her, Grandma, what an honor it is to be here on your 104th birthday. Everybody grew quiet, and then she looked at me and smiled and said, Thank you very much. I'm glad you came. I looked at her again, and I said, That is a powerful and wonderful milestone of life, 104 years. 
She looked at me and said, yes, it's gone by quickly. And then I will never forget, I looked at her and thought I'd get a little smart. And so I looked at her and I said, well, Grandma, I hope I get a chance to be with you on your 105th birthday. She looked at me and smiled. Now everybody's listening. She looked at me and smiled and she said, well, I don't know why not, young man. You look plenty healthy to me. God has been good through this whole period of time, and it is a joy to just be a part of this service today. I want you to understand something that I'm sure you already know, but I want to make a statement nonetheless. Where churches meet together are, is important. In fact, it's necessary because what the church looks like, what it does represents what the core values of the church really are. But I want you to understand, and this is an important, important understanding as we move forward, that in reality, this building is not the church. I think you already know that. You are the church. And I have said to individuals over and over again, if you want to grow a church, learn a biblical model of evangelism. What is the biblical model of evangelism? It is not tucking a Bible under our arm arming ourselves with tracts like the four spiritual laws and going out and passing them out to people in the community. I'm not saying that can't be done. I'm not saying that doesn't produce results. But that's not the biblical model of evangelism that God has given to us. If we want to see this church grow, it is imperative that we embrace the biblical model of evangelism as the church. And I believe that it can best be summed up with two very interesting words, express and explain. When we go from this building, we express what we have received through Jesus Christ. And then when people note the difference in lifestyle and ask us questions, we explain how we came to possess what God has given us. And it's out of that that people come into the house of God and they become an important part of what God is doing and what he desires to do in our lives. What I want to do today is talk to you about the house that God blesses. This in reality is a house that houses the church, a beautiful facility. And I am so grateful that God chose to reach down and touch Chris and, and touch Robin and to see them here today, the great job that they are doing all of you in support of them. But I want us to understand that there is a house that God blesses. Even though there's a church that dwells in that house, there is a house or a building that God actually blesses. And we have a model of it in Scripture. In 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 7 through 21, we have a powerful statement that is made. And what you actually have here is Solomon approaching the time when he is about to dedicate the house that God built, that he built. Now look what it says. Verse 7. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. But the Lord said to David my father, whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, it is not you who shall build the house, but your son who shall be born to you shall build the house for my namesake. Now the Lord has fulfilled his promise that he made, for I have risen in the place of David my father and set on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the house for the name of the Lord, the God of Israel. And there I have set the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord that he made with the people of Israel." Then look at verse 12. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands. Solomon had made a bronze platform five cubits long, five cubits wide, and three cubits high, and had set it in the court, and he stood on it. Then he knelt on his knees in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven and said, O Lord God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven or on earth, keeping covenant and showing steadfast love to your servants who walk before you with all their heart, who have kept with your servant David my father what you declared to him. You spoke with your mouth and with your hand and fulfilled it to this day. 
Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, keep for your servant David my father what you promised him, saying, You shall not lack a man to set before me on the throne of Israel if only your sons pay close attention to their way to walk in my law as you have walked before me. Now therefore, O Lord God of Israel, let your words be confirmed which you have spoken to your servant David. Then follows chapter 7, and we're not going to read that, but chapter 7 in reality was the dedication of the temple. And you will find included in that entire chapter some amazing things that tell us what kind of house God blesses. You've been in this building for about six months. It is well built. It is an amazing place. I am so thrilled to see what God has done. The leadership of this church has done well in all of the things that they have provided. But I want you to understand that the one closing factor even though it's important that we pay the bills and finish off all the things that are there, perhaps the most important factor at the conclusion of the building is the blessing of God. All of the things that go in between are important, but there is nothing more important than the blessing of God. For if God's blessing is not there, these are just chairs. If God's blessing is not there, these are just walls. If God's blessings are not there, no matter how beautiful all the rest of the building may be, it is simply another building unless God's blessing is there. And I believe down deep in my heart that's not only something that your pastor and his wife desires and the leadership of the church, it is something that we all desire. What we have just read is a very special, special scene from the history of Israel. These people, after having worshipped God in the tabernacle for so many years, just a tent, are now moving into a fantastic and glorious building. There has been nothing like it in the history of Israel prior to this time. And he's standing in the magnificent temple. They've gathered before the Lord to seek his blessing and to entreat him to pour out his spirit upon that house. And when he finishes praying, this is amazing to me, the Lord answers by sending fire from heaven to consume the burnt offerings Woo. and by filling the temple with his glory. In fact, the Bible says that God's presence was so powerful on that place that the priest weren't even able to go in and minister. So we built a church. It's been a long process. It's happened in stages. I built on people that preceded me, the foundations that they laid. And then, of course, we laid foundations and others built upon that. And that's all an important part of what God wants to do and is doing. But we have to somehow ask the question, what kind of house does God bless? Because you desire, I know, to see the blessing of the Lord on this house. So let's go through some of the things that I learned when I was reading this as part of the house that God actually blesses. First of all, it was supposed to be a house of prayer. I'm encouraging you to go back later on and read through the verses of Scripture that have been shared with you. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 12 through 19, it actually says, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord in the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and his own house, he successfully accomplished. And then it talks about something that he did immediately following that. He brought that house to God as a place of prayer. It should be a place of prayer. It's so important that it become a place of prayer. But in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 11 through 19, it was a place that was consecrated. And in Isaiah 56, 7, the Lord says that his house is to be what? A house of prayer. It's not just a place where we sit and listen and grow. It must become a place where we meet with God in specific prayer. And Jesus reaffirmed that truth in the New Testament. He says, my house shall be called a house of prayer. 
of all the businesses conducted at the church house, none touches even the hem of the garment of prayer. God's house, hear me carefully, God's house must ever be known as a place of prayer and God's people must always be known as people of prayer. Now that's imperative. It's necessary for us to understand the part of that that's a kind of house that God blesses. God honors a praying people because a praying people honor God. And so I encourage as leadership and encourage the people of this church to keep a primary focus on prayer. Keep prayer at the center of everything that you do. I would love to hear that as your pastor walks into the church building at any hour of the day or night, you find people at the altar praying and seeking God. For that is what is going to make a difference in the areas that you reach out to within your community. Secondly, it was supposed to be a place for cares. As Solomon prays, he asks the Lord to hear the supplication of God's people. And he wants the Lord's house to be a place where one can bring their cares and leave them. When I look back over the time that we pastored here in Williston, it wasn't an uncommon thing to walk into this church, not this one, the smaller one that's hooked on to this one, and walk toward the front and see two or three individuals there seeking God because of the problems that they faced. It was a place of care. And when you bring that need to the house of prayer, friend, you don't have to fret and worry. You don't have to fear life's hills and valleys. You just learn that God has a place of prayer and that he invites you to come to it. Hallelujah. Boy, you're all quiet. You all awake here? It's a place for conflicts. Well, that sounds a little bit different. A place for conflicts. And what do we mean? Is this a place where we fight? No. What it really means, it's a place where we resolve our conflicts. It's a place where we can come together in the presence of the Lord that has already been bathed in prayer and we resolve our conflicts. And, uh, conflicts. and Solomon says that when there is trouble between two parties, that the place to settle that is before the presence of the Lord in prayer. Any church will go through times of conflict. We did. Others did before us. But sometimes we feel that the place for resolving conflicts is in the pastor's office or a place for resolving conflicts is somewhere else in a court of law. But for God's people, the place for resolving conflicts is in the house of prayer. That's where that should be taken care of. There are problems that we face. It's a place for resolving conflicts. Here Hear me carefully. It's not possible to worship God with bitterness in your heart toward a brother in Christ. That's why a place for resolving conflicts is the house of God. Thirdly, it's a place for casualties. That's an interesting statement. What do I mean by that? Well, Solomon calls upon the Lord to hear the cry of the battle-weary believer and whether we understand it all or not, we are engaged in a brutal conflict all through the time of us serving God. I love the words of an old uh, evangelist that used to travel throughout the Dakotas. His name was Lowell Lundstrom. Some of you probably remember him. But there's this song that he would sing. And I love the words of this song. It went this way. It's a battlefield, brother, not a recreation room. It's a fight and not a game. Run if you want to, run if you will, but I came here to stay. Basically, the words of that song just let us know that these are the kinds of battles that God's people will face. And I don't know of any other place than the house of the Lord to address those issues. So it's not only a place for conflicts, a place for casualties. It's also a place for confession. And I love that statement. Verses 26 through 30 of chapter 6 says this. He deals with the sins of the people. And although this has been an undercurrent all the way through those verses, he now teaches us that prayer is the remedy for our sin problems. The Lord's house is the place to take our sins. When there's evil in our lives, our church is hindered. And so the house of God must become a place 
an important place for confession where we can come into God's presence and say, Lord, I'm sorry, I've sinned, I've done what I should not have done, will you forgive me? And whether there's a large crowd or whether no one but yourself, the house that God blesses is a place where there is confession and there is healing. Don't allow your sins to stand between you and the Lord's blessings upon this church. That's important. Then it's a place for consecration. When we pray, we ought to seek the Lord's face, seek his will, and seek his glory in our lives. And there is no better place for us to make our vows unto the Lord than in his house at his altar. Amen? But secondly, it's supposed to be a place of people. Now, when we use that word, there are some interesting statements made with that. Because in 2 Chronicles 6, 32 through 39, he talks about the kind of people that will be in his house. And it's amazing when you begin to study it. First of all, in verse 32 and 33, he tells us it's a place for the wandering stranger. Sometimes we get the mistaken idea that the church is only for membership. But the reality is that the church is for all people. And here we see that even the people who weren't part of God's covenant with Israel were welcome to come to the temple and to call upon the name of the Lord. God always stresses that. You remember the story in the Bible where an individual, or whether, where rather Jesus comes into the temple and he sees people buying and selling? There in the temple, he becomes angry. It's one of the few times he becomes really angry and he overturns the tables of the money changers and drives them out of the temple. I used to think that that was because God wouldn't abide buying and selling in the house of God. That's not the case. When you begin to dig deeper and study the concepts behind that whole story, God, or rather in the temple, there had always been buying and selling. When people came to offer sacrifices, they would purchase their lambs, they would purchase their goats, they would purchase whatever they wanted to sacrifice, turtle doves, pigeons. And then they would go into the temple and sacrifice it. So buying and selling had always taken place. The problem that Jesus was angry about is that the buying and selling took place in the court of the Gentiles. And so now the Gentile people had no place where they could call out to God. And he walks into that place in anger because there is now no expression for people who don't know him. Listen to me, friends. In altogether too many times across this nation when I travel, I watch the house of God become a house where only, quote, believers feel comfortable. And yet what God desires is that it be a place that welcomes the unbelievers because where can they find Christ except in a place where they sense the power and the presence of God. A place for the wandering stranger. And then verse 34 and 35 tells us it's a place for the warring saint. We're involved in a battle, amen? And then verse 36 and 39 tells us it's a place for the wayward saint. It's a place where God's people who have strayed away can come back and found, find Christ. And I remember I could tell story after story of individuals that did that and came back to Jesus and the rejoicing and the celebration that took place because the house of God had become a place for the wayward saint. The third thing that I want us to look at today is to understand that it's a place of power. Wow, not just a place of people. It's a place of power. Second Chronicles 7, 1 and 2, first two verses in chapter 7, tells us that as soon as Solomon finished his prayer, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Whew. I love that. And I believe that God desires to do that within this place as well. It's a place of power. It's a place of miraculous power. The Bible says that when Solomon finished praying, as we've already read, fire came down. It wasn't the fire of man. It was a miraculous presence of the power of God. And there will be times in the future when you will gather together and God's people will begin to rejoice and praise the Lord and you will suddenly find this building simply a building but it is a house and God desires to bless this house with his power. Oh, we need that. 
of miraculous power, of manifest power. What do I mean by manifest power? The Bible tells us that the glory of the Lord filled the house. And when the Lord moved into his house, he filled the place with his presence and glory. Wow. This is one beautiful place. As architects, you have done an amazing job. And as pastor and leaders, you have done an amazing job. But today we dedicate this place. And here's my prayer. My prayer is that this place will not be known as much for its ascetic beauty beauty, as it is for the beauty of Jesus Christ who lives and resides here. That when people come in, though it's beautiful to behold and see, That's not the beauty they actually see. The beauty they see is the beauty of God's people representing miraculously his power through their lives. It's a place of matchless power. I love what the Bible has to say on this whole issue. It's verse uh, 2 says that when the Lord showed up, even the priest in their holy vestments were unable to enter the temple. Wow, in the presence of the Lord. God begins to move in a church. He's going to move in a miraculous, matchless way. And he will demonstrate his power through his people and through the lost. You know what I've learned in the period of time that I've lived? I've learned that God has a way of doing things that leave men shaking their heads in amazement at his power and glory. And he can do that within this place. When the church is moving under the power and approval of the Lord, there is no force under heaven that can stand in their way. Remember the two words I gave you about evangelism? Express and explain. That's exactly what is necessary because the real mission of the church begins when you exit through the door. Next, it is a place of praise. 2 Chronicles 7, 3 makes this statement, and I love this statement. It says, when all of the people of Israel saw the fire come down and the glory of the Lord on the temple, they bowed down with their faces to the ground on the pavement and worshiped and gave thanks to the Lord, saying, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. The kind of place that God blesses has to be a place of wonder. And you look back over what God has done in the past years, and you have to just stand in wonder We were talking about it last night as we met together over a meal. Your pastor, his wife and myself and my wife, we met together and we began to talk about what God had done over these years and how he had moved. And all of a sudden, for me, the house of God became a place of wonder where I just look in amazement at what God has done. Then it must be a place of worship. As they praised the Lord, they also worshiped him. That is, they fell before him in humble adoration and exaltation. Our churches ought to be places of worship. And when we come to the house of the Lord, our minds are on a million other things besides honoring the Lord. But what must happen somehow is that we must be moved together to a place of worship. And I want all of us, wherever we are ministering, wherever we attend church, One of the marks of the beauty and the place that God blesses is that when we enter the tabernacle, the focus is not just upon the ascetic beauty of the the church itself, but what we see are people's hands raised and worship to God, and what we hear are the people's voice lived or, or raised in praise to God so that God can continue to work. What is worship? Genuine worship is all I am responding in adoration for all that he is. And when we come into the presence of God, I don't I pray that we will not simply focus on the style of music or or the excellence of the orchestra even though that's important. What I pray we will focus upon is almighty God himself and that all of a sudden our hearts will be raised toward him. And when God sees that within this building, 
here in Williston, North Dakota, when he sees that happen within this building, this building will become a place that God blesses. That's something we desperately need in our own hearts and in our own lives. Just as the Lord will bless a praying church and he will bless a church open to the needs of people and just as he will pour out of his spirit on a people that's yielded to them, he will bless a church that's not ashamed to praise the name of the Lord. I love the words of this song. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in thee, Lord. The humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he heard me, and he delivered me from all my fears. As I look around, this building has so much more than what we had. The first building that I pastored in when I was 31 years of age in Williston was a great building. It wasn't long before, however, we outgrew it. And we moved from there into a high school auditorium. You know what I found out? I found out that God could bless a high school auditorium. And then we moved from the auditorium to this place that we're at. Somewhere under the floors of the older building that this is tied on to, my name is written. And I put it there on purpose because I was committed to continuing to pray for what God was going to do in this place. So my prayer is that as beautiful as all of this is, and I'm impressed and amazed, my prayer is that from this Sunday forward, and maybe even in the past, this congregation and church will not simply be made known or be known for the ascetic beauty of its building. Even though that's good and that's important, my prayer is that it will be made or be known for the beauty and the worship and the prayer and the praise of the people that are part of this. Pastor, I want to thank you for the privilege of sharing here today. We drove into town, a thousand memories came through our minds. Some were very humorous, we talked about them last night. Some were very serious. People that we've loved have gone on to be with the Lord. Many of you we still recognize and see here today. You've gotten a lot older than I have. But I'm excited. I'm excited not for what has happened. I'm excited for what will happen.